Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you all for spending a little bit of time with me this evening. My name is Jack Wang. I'm an independent financial advisor. I actually grew up here in Chelmsford. I went to Chelmsford High. My sons went to Chelmsford High. My wife and I actually now live in Westford, so we're still nearby. And we're going to be talking about college, college financial aid. And I want this to be very much an interactive session. So my, my job is to answer your questions, OK? Um, but just to give you a little bit of, of uh, context of sort of how I'm in this, involved in this. So I have two sons. Uh, one is about to graduate from Temple University. My other one is uh, a junior at UMass Amherst uh, in criminal justice. In fact, he's home on spring break. I'm about to drive him to the bus station tomorrow so he can go down to Philadelphia to see his brother. Um, so, so it's my one time during all spring break I'm going to see him, right? I'm, I have the privilege of driving him into South Station tomorrow. And then my wife has two, so she has a 15-year-old ninth grader, um, so freshman at Westford Academy, and then a 11-year-old uh, sixth grader. So what this means is that I've been through this process and then I have a little bit of reprieve, and then I have to do this again, okay? So I don't get away from this, okay? Um, so, uh, so again, my, I'm here to answer your questions, any and all, um, about the whole process because it is very, very complicated, it's very confusing. A lot of people say that it's a game. It is. And my job here also is to share with you tips to help you in the process, okay? Um, one quick note, so how many of you, I think uh, someone mentioned, how many of you have attended the MIFA presentation at the high school? One? Okay, okay, good information, right? Okay, it's a lot of information, okay. So MIFA's Mass Educational Finance Authority, and they will do a session every fall and sometimes spring at Chelmsford High, at, at all the local high schools, okay? And they'll go uh, over all the ins and outs of financial aid, and student loans and things like that. And they do a great job. You can even see their presentation online on their website. But you also have to remember who is giving the information, right? The speakers tend to be financial aid officers at area colleges. I know this because one of my best friends who used to be a financial aid officer at MIT used to do the one for Lowell High. And it's very good, it's very factual, but think about, but think about it, right? They're going to answer questions. What is a student loan? How does it work? They'll answer that for you. But what they're not going to answer is, should I use that? Should I save in my kid's name? Should I do this? How do I get more financial aid, right? Because it's kind of like going to Vegas and going to blackjack dealers and asking the blackjack dealer how to count cards, right? They're never going to tell you, right? They're never going to tell you how to game the system, win more money, OK? It's actually my job. Ha <laughs> um, ha. So this is what I help clients with. All right. Um, anybody want to guess this? To, so my firm name is Longhorn Financial. Anybody want to guess where I went to college? University of Texas. Right. I did not name my firm Longhorn Financial after what some people think is my like of Longhorn Steakhouse. I don't like it that much to name my business after it. Um, but some people do think that. Whatever. So what I'd like to do just very, very quickly is just have you just briefly introduce yourself, your name, and just one question or one thing that you're really looking to get out tonight. And I just want to make sure that I cover it, OK? Just so, that, just so we get that um, and so it's worthwhile for you, all right? So why don't we start over here? Yes? So I'm an ambassador. I'm a senior at Chelsea Tech, working Great. with a wide range of schools. I guess I'm trying to figure out. Uh, we're still trying to figure out which ones we can afford. And, and I guess it's really you know, how, to, just how, how to manage it. OK, great. Thank you, Diane. My name is Sam. Um, I don't know much about it, but all I heard is this whole system of game is good if you're very poor or you're really, really rich. rich. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, yeah. OK, thank you, Sam. Would you like to introduce yourself, yeah. kind sir? Hey, Jack. I, uh, my name is Dennis Wallen, um, and I, I, I know this guy. I, I, I know Jack, and I want to I want to get him smarter about what Jack does because I can introduce him to some of my clients. But I'm very interested in what the biggest misconceptions uh, people have about 
college finance. And, and Dennis, do you want to um, tell people what you do? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, I own a tutoring company in Chelmsford called Clubs and Tutoring, uh, which your kids a lot of times with SAT, ACT prep, uh, as well as other subjects. And, uh, Jack's a great resource for my clients uh, to be able to refer to for uh, college, college finance and help them be able to strategize how to pay less and get more. Yeah, Dennis. Um, Dennis. So we complement each other, right? So I don't. I don't do any tutoring. I will not write your kids essay. It's not. I don't do any of that stuff. But but he can help with that. So good to see you, Dennis. Um, I'm a senior and sophomore, and I just I know they calculated that PFC, but there's no way. My husband can't. We had a daughter that went to college back in '89 to 1993. So now we have a granddaughter that's going, our first grandchild going to college. So we just want to get information and see what we can do to help and understand the process more. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. Awesome. All right. Great. Yes, please. I'm Dave Walsh. This is Christy. Um, I want you to show me where to find the money. <laughs> <laughs> we have four show kids. We have a senior, <clears throat> freshman, an eighth grader, and a Okay, very good. Can I talk to you, Dennis, on the phone? Yes. Or can I have a <laughs> and my, well, one, it would be nice to know some of these patterns, is that the right? Because I mm -hmm. hear a lot of that when it comes to loans. And um, and also, like, because we're new to the whole college process, too, like, do you not apply to schools because they're, like, out of reach? Or do you apply to the schools and then work the financial aid side of things? So that, that's one of my questions. Okay, very good. Thank you. Bill, um, and I want to learn more about finding money. I, where, where does, what, the balance, we do, you know, kind of a collection of what has already been said. But. Okay, and, you're, and how old is your student? We have a senior uh, and a freshman. Junior and freshman, awesome, okay, last but not least. And I'm David Crawford, um, interested in all of that more, but really, one thing that really interests me is I have three, almost four, um, well, and my oldest is a junior, and I'm also interested to know how much we should gauge in terms of applying savings towards our oldest if, in the context of, well, we get potentially get more support to schools, what's well, two in the system and then three in the system simultaneously. Okay. Um, or if we should just prepare for the answer. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, okay, great. So thank you very much for that. Hey, Mike, how are you? <laughs> Yeah. Glad to see you. Um, so, Mike, we're just uh, uh, going around introducing everyone. So, uh, uh, question anything that you want to know about the college financial aid process? Pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Just, just run the gamut. Okay, okay, good. Yes, of course. You know, we hear this kind of scholarship money out there, grant yep. money, and trying to figure out budgets and how we approach that. Sort of navigate through that, prioritize things so we can get our son to. You know, writing essays or doing things, applying, you know, wherever there's free money available. So once he gets to be a junior or senior, Naviance has everything available. Like it it's pretty much full. Oh. There must be 200 scholarships you can apply to. And kids just click them, get the information, there's transcripts go. Yeah. And there must be stuff outside of Naviance too. There is, but clubs. Yeah. And, and if. Even come and in fact, I'll address that right now. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. But there are scholarships both inside Naviance, right, as well as outside Naviance. There's a lot of scholarship search engines. And in fact, for many of you who have younger students, you can start as early as ninth grade. There's no reason to wait till junior year or senior year. Now, granted, ninth grade, there's fewer scholarships. And then there's a little bit more in 10. And then there's a little bit more in 11, right, then a lot more in 12. Right? And then even into college, so when they're college freshmen, college sophomore, college junior, those scholarships still exist. So, for, so I told you, so my stepdaughter, 15 years old freshman at uh, Westford Academy, I already have her on scholarship searches. And just to give you an example, so last year, Staple, last year, two years ago, um, they're not doing it this year, but they, like Staples had like a, like a scholarship lottery. And so if you went to Staples and bought more than $25 worth of stuff, a special code at the bottom of your seat and if you wind down to the staples foundation or something website put it in 
Well, first prize was $50,000 in college money, ages 13 and up. So if you have an eighth grader now, you're gearing up for this right now. There's no point in waiting. There's no point in waiting. I mean, you can. Well, actually, let, let's put it this way. Uh, college financial aid is a zero-sum game. Okay, anybody know what that means? Zero sum, it's a, right? So, exactly, right? So think of it like a pie, right? If I'm gonna take a bigger slice, that means everybody else gets a smaller slice. So one of the things you wanna think about is if you're not going to apply for these scholarships or apply for financial aid because you've heard it too complicated or whatever, right? If, if that's what you're gonna do, right? Then all the other parents should say one thing. Thank you, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly, so I mean, I tell that, and, 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 and honestly, it's true. So I mean, I, I've told parents where, you know, if, if another, if your uh, friend's parents are, or the, your child's friend's parents are not gonna apply and their kids apply to the same school as you, and they say, I'm not gonna fill out the FAFSA, it's way too complicated, thank you, right? High five them, bake them some cookies, give them a hug, and when they ask you, wow, why are you so friendly? You just, well, I'm, just a, I'm just a friendly guy. <laughs> right? You're paying for my kid's college. I figure I owe you a hug. Um, no, that's true. So you want to take advantage of some of those things. And I'm going to talk also about why some of these things are important down the road. So the presentation today, I'm going to go into a little bit more loan details and paying strategies. But we also have a lot of, you know, most of you have younger children here. So I'm also going to give you some tips around financial aid planning strategies for your younger children. Okay, and so I'm gonna cover a little bit sort of how the rules of the game work. Okay, for seniors, you're kinda of on the cusp. For juniors and younger, you got a little bit of time to, to kind of figure this out. Okay, yeah. This is like on the other side, we're going through it, I have is like knowing about these scholarships early, you don't have to write new essays every time. Right. A lot of days, and so you kinda of know which ones you're applying for, Taylor, one or two essays that you can use for multiple times. Yep. Because at least from my experience, uh, trying to get them to sit down and write a 500 word essay is, right. is a bigger challenge than applying for the scholarship. Right. Because you know it's true, right? Yep. So, yeah. and no, so I think thank that's you. One of the things if I have to do it all over again is to consolidate some of these scholarships, look at what kind of essays they're asking for, and see if I could tailor a couple of them as opposed to start right. fresh over time. Because some of them just are nuanced in what they want. Right? right, exactly, exactly, thank you. All right, so, okay. So we're gonna talk about understanding war letters. Um, so again, this is more, mostly tailored towards seniors, but junior and younger parents, understanding the end result and what that looks like, I will then work backwards and sort of explain how you get there and what these things mean. All right, so we're actually going to look at a sample award letter because that's for seniors, that's what's happening right now. They're getting their financial aid award letters. We're going to talk about the various payment options, some of which you already know. So if you've attended that MIFA presentation, you may have heard of these. We're going to go through some of the pros and cons of each option. We're going to talk about strategies and considerations. So I've been doing this a long time. And so I run to a lot of different situations. And also things like when grandparents or other relatives want to help out with college. What's the financial aid impact on that, okay? And I'm gonna tell you this, okay? So, so financial aid is a game. There are so many tricks, traps, rules. It's the financial aid regulations read like the tax code. And I'm gonna tell you that there's no one magic bullet, right? There's nothing I can tell you that's gonna magically get you like $20,000 of extra aid. However, what I can guarantee you is that if you, by not knowing the rules, if you unintentionally make a mistake, and I will tell, share horror stories with you, if you unintentionally make a mistake, you can easily wipe out your chances for aid in a blink and not know it, okay? Some common everyday things and just poof, gone, done, end of story, all right? Got to understand the rules, and I'll share some of those with you, okay? So let's just go over kind of the basic timeline. Again, this is more for seniors, but junior parents, just to give you an idea. So typically the deadline date is May 1st, is when the schools want to hear from the students, all right? 
Now, that's, that's a pretty hard and fast date, although in reality, most schools now are letting it slide May 2nd, May 3rd. So for senior parents, if your child is committed to one of the schools by May 1st, but did not tell the other schools no, don't be surprised if you get a call on May 2nd or May 3rd from one of the other schools saying, hey, by the way, did your kid make a decision? Because if not, we'll throw you an extra thousand bucks to come here. Because you have to remember that colleges are a business. They're trying to attract students, right? Just like businesses want to attract customers, colleges want to attract athletes. Well, they attract based on academics as well, okay? Late June, early July is typically when you can use the PLUS loan. And we'll talk about what the PLUS loan is, but basically it's the parent version of the student loan. That window actually opens up early this year. It actually opens up, I think, at the end of this month. Historically, I tell people around 4th of July weekend, if that's the strategy you're going to use, go out, have a nice time at a barbecue. When you get back after having a couple of beers, get on the computer, you can apply for a bunch of loans. Um, <laughs> Uh, typically July, August is when you get the first bill. Important to know also that bills at colleges run on a semester basis. So we as parents think about it on an annual basis, right? It's going to be $20,000 for the year, right? Colleges bill on a semester basis or trimester basis, however they do it. Um, and that's going to matter later on. And then typically August, September is when the first bills are due. So you either have had to write the check made arrangements for the loan, whatever loan you're going to use, or, um, or you've entered into some sort of payment plan, like a monthly payment plan, almost like a, like a layaway program, right? You can do that as well, okay? But that is generally the rough timeline, the, 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 the rough timeline, okay? Right? Junior parent, well, actually, I'll come back to that. All right, we're going to talk about understand war letters. So, the challenge of this is there's 5,500-ish 5, schools in the United States, and they all pretty much use a different format, which makes it really hard to decipher. And so this particular one is actually from Hofstra University. It was a client from several years ago. I like it because they actually do a really good job of explaining things, because some award letters don't tell you anything. And I'm also going to tell you some of the tricks that they use to, get, to make you think you're getting a bigger award than you actually are. Okay, and we're going to break this down by section. Okay, so the first section is this, okay? And again, there's a lot of things to go into this. So some schools will list out the cost. And so what you're looking at is what's called um, the cost of attendance. And so someone asked about definitions and acronyms. On your college tours, and even for senior parents, you might see the acronym COA, cost of attendance. And quite simply, what that means is it's the sticker price of the car. So it's tuition, room book, you know, tuition, room board fees, books, and allocation for books, transportation, miscellaneous expenses. Okay, COA, cost of. And so one of the things that schools will sometimes do is because remember with book, with things like books, right, and transportation, right, you it's not a hard charge, right? You can get new textbooks. You can get used textbooks. You can even rent textbooks. So sometimes what schools will do to make themselves look a little cheaper is they'll give you what's called the direct cost, which is only tuition, fees, and room and board, and leave the other things out. So it looks like it's a little bit less money. And then when you go and compare schools, you'll see, oh, school A, $50,000. School B, $47,000. Well, school B must be less money. Well, no, not necessarily, because school B could have left out all those costs. Right? Same thing, they do this on award letters to, to get you as parents to think, see, they're, they're much less money, right? Your kid should go here because they didn't include all those things. Right? Now, mind you, okay, that for example, in this example, it lists out that books are $1,000. Remember, I have two kids in college. I've yet to pay $1,000 total for their entire time because there's not a chance on earth I was going to let them get new textbooks, right, unless they were absolutely forced to. They got, they got used, <laughs> especially the ones that already had the answers in them. Those are nicer. Um, and my older son ended up renting. So I don't think we even paid 500 total. But schools have, by law, required to sort of estimate a figure because you might be the type of parent who wants brand new textbooks for their son or daughter. Nothing wrong with that, right? That's up to you. 
Okay. So any questions on this for right now? Now as part of your college search, one of the things, junior parents and younger, one of the things that really scares people is the sticker price of college. So you look at things like BU at 70,000, right? NYU about 75,000. You know, whatever else is up there. I mean, it's, it's pretty expensive. Um, very few people actually pay full sticker price. I mean, you can, I mean, that's up to you, right? I, I don't recommend it, but you can. Um, so as you're in the process of searching for schools, don't necessarily let sticker price turn you off. And part of this also is a game. It's a psychology type, a psychological game. We as parents get suckered. I mean, plain and simple, we get suckered. We as parents think that the more expensive the school, the better it must be. So colleges play this game that they will gradually raise the sticker price every year. Now, of course, they will gradually raise the amount they give you in scholarships to offset it, right? So what's called your net price really doesn't change, right? But they will play this game and they'll up, 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 right? And so that that way, and part of this, truthfully, is, is to allow you as parents to be able to say to your peers and your neighbors and, your, your, and the grandparents and aunts and uncles, oh, you know, my kid got into so-and-so and he got a $50,000 scholarship. Right? Now, of course, what you're not saying is that the sticker price was like 80000 right? But, you know, but sounds awesome, right? My kid got in, got a $50,000 scholarship. Um, so they play that game. So don't, so just be aware of that, right, while you're on your tours and everything else, okay, that colleges will do this, okay? Any questions so far? I know we go kind of fast. Any questions so far? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, colleges are required, legally required by the Department of Ed to publish a cost of attendance. But again, in the marketing materials, they might say, oh yeah, it's only this, and they leave out these other things. Okay. Okay. Good question. All right. The next section is scholarships, and this again has a huge impact on you, junior parents. So, in this example, okay, it says you Hofstra Presidential Scholarship, twenty-two thousand dollars sounds pretty good, and likely it's a merit scholarship based on grades, SAT, GPA, whatever. Okay, but from this number, I can tell how much the school wanted the student for whatever reason they wanted him. Okay, so for you in your college search, for especially for those of you with three, four, five, ten children who need to pay for, right, the best way to lower college costs is to find the school that really wants your child for whatever reason they want him. Could be grades, could be GPA, could be whatever. Okay, and I'm going to talk more about that in just a moment. But this number right here tells me how much they wanted the, the student for whatever reason. So all school, almost all schools will publish on the College Board website, okay, the same website where your son or daughter can get their SAT scores or their AP grades. If you look up each school and look up in the paying section, each school will publish what they give out in what's called non-need aid each year, what the average is. So in this case, Hofstra gives out 20, in, in this example, they give out 22,000. Now I can look up what the average is and I can see well, if the average was 30,000, but this kid got 22, what does that tell me? They didn't really want it, for, again, for whatever reason. Now, now you have to, right, versus the other way, right, so this is 22,000, but if Hofstra's average is 10, right, then they really wanted him. And so part of understanding that is because colleges recruit students to raise their profile, right? It could be gender balance, right, gender mix, could be in-state, out-of-state, could be promoting a particular major or program, right, or anything else, right? Colleges are always trying to recruit to sort of raise their profile in some more way. Hang on one sec, all right? And how they recruit students is through something like this. So this number right here, senior parents, tells me a lot, right? In fact, a lot of colleges on their own website will actually publish the range of scholarships as well, not Hofstra. Um, so I, I was looking at one college, you'll say, okay, uh, the range of merit scholarships we give is between eight and 21,000. 
Well, again, you could have graduated dead last from Chelsea High, but gotten in, you get 8,000. And parents will think, wow, I got $8,000. Well, if the school publishes that they give at least eight to 21 to everybody, getting $8,000 doesn't tell me, right? It, it tells me a lot and it's not good, okay? On the other hand, if you got the 21,000, it's great. School, other schools will put a maximum. So for example, Assumption College, right? They'll, they show on their website, maximum 24,000. They don't put a minimum, they put a maximum. So one of my clients this year actually got the max, 24,000, right? But again, that tells me something, okay? Why does this matter? Well, it tells me where your child ranked relatively relative to other applicants. It also leads to another strategy in terms of asking for more money. So if they really want your student as reflected in this number and you go ask them for more money after the fact, they're more likely to play ball. If they really didn't want your student reflected in this and you go ask for money after the fact, more money, your phone call is not going to get answered. <laughs> And now, so actually, before I go on, Mike, you had a question. Yeah, to build on this, I have twins. <laughs> and they, there's only one school where they apply to, to the same school. And the financial aid, when we were up there, it was University of Vermont, we started rolling our eyes. Oh, we hate parents like you with twins. You can do a direct comparison. And that was a direct quote from her. Because how many of us want to talk about our own financial things with parents? But it's actually played to our advantage because we had twins. Right. And we can see what they were offering for each one of them. Yep. Now, now, for you junior parents and younger, part, right, again, I talked about how the way to lower cost of college is to do a really careful selection. Generally speaking, you want your child in the top 25% of all applicants. As a general rule of thumb, if you want to max out aid, max out scholarship, your potential, okay? And, even, and, and you want to also understand the school you're applying to. So for example, UMass Lowell, state school, right? Do state schools give out merit scholarships? They do, but most people say they don't. But if you want a merit scholarship at UMass Lowell, you need to be in the top 10% of all applicants, which means 90% of applicants get exactly that much. Hence the reputation, oh yeah, schools don't give out merit scholarships. Give you another example. There's a private university in Boston, tick below Ivy League. They're known, and people mind she like, oh yeah, they don't they don't give out private, they only give out scholarships. They never give out aid. But they do. But let me explain. So for those of you whose children have taken the SAT, what is the top score on the SAT, the absolute maximum? 1600. To be in the top 25% of the school, you need a 1520. This school only gives out scholarships to the top 10% of all their applicants. So if you look at SAT scores, if you know that the top 25% is to have a 1520, the maximum is 1600, to, what do you think you need to be in the top 10%? Probably a 1600 or very close, okay? So when you go into this and your college starts saying, well, you know, I hope they're going to give me a scholarship, you're trying to look to see where your child ranks relative to those applicants. Okay? That doesn't mean that your child should apply to a bad school. I've had parents say that to me. That doesn't mean that at all. Right? <clears throat> but it can also vary by program. So for example, UMass Lowell, you want to go in a, as a whatever major, you know, maybe the GPA requirement's not that tough. You want to go in for engineering? It is hard to get in, okay? UMass Amherst, where my son goes. Business school, you need almost a 4.0 to even get a sniff at the business school, okay? So these things can vary by major. So for, for, again, for those of you who are younger, uh, have younger children, you want to lower the cost of college, you're spending your time right now, it starts right now, to find these schools. And they may or may not be around here. And that's why touring, open houses, blah, 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 become critically important. Yes? So, I get a, I get a sense that if your kid's very outstanding, right, that you might have more options, but if there's sort of more of a mediocre student, yep. 
you know, be bus range or, or be you know, whatever, then, then oh. do you have the same opportunities? Absolutely. It's just find, you're saying, finding that right school that looks right. them. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll give you examples. So I, have a, I have a client in, um, in Wilmington. Um, she wants to apply to Northeastern, BC, some other schools for business. And, she, and she's an average student, like B, you know, B plus type of range, okay? S, SATs are okay. But she was, so she, her grades were good enough to get her in. So she was sort of in average, right? Sort of straight, straight down the, the strike zone. She was going to get in. But she wasn't going to be sort of high enough to qualify for a lot of merit money. So we looked around, and actually one of my colleagues who does college admissions counseling, we, you know, we all talked, and we ended up getting her um, recommending a small private school out in Newton called LaSalle. Okay, now LaSalle's sticker price was like 50000 Their average merit scholarship each year was only 10000 but because she fit their profile, she got the biggest merit scholarship in terms of percentage that like we've ever seen. They threw her $36,000 when the average was 10. Okay, so 50,000 minus 36, out of pocket 14, students can borrow on their own. Not a bad deal. Of course, of course, you know what the kid said. The guy don't want to go there. Like, I'm telling the dad like, she's going there. Right, you're, you're either making her or I'm making her. She's going there, okay? There's just no question, okay? But different schools look for different kids. And you also have to remember, so even if your child is a valedictorian, right, which means they worked really hard, and that's a really good thing. There's 30,000 high schools in the United States, which means how many valedictorians are there? 30,000, right? And so when they all apply to Harvard, doesn't really stand out, unfortunately. Right? So the search process is critical. The other thing to understand is that these things, you also see up there, University Assistance Grant, understanding <coughs> whether these things are merit-based, which are based, based on grades, SATs, whatever, or they're need-based. And need-based is based on your financial information. And the reason that's important is because, remember parents, you have to fill out the financial aid form every single year. And so if this year you're really poor on paper, but next year you win the lottery, some portion of your financial aid package might go away because your income or assets are much higher, right? Which is obviously then going to change the cost for you. Okay. But if, so, yeah. Question on that: If you, um, if everything otherwise stays the same, when you get a financial aid package as a freshman, um, that should mostly stay. If you stay the same, should that? package mostly stay or can they hold that? So should the package mostly stay? The answer generally is yes, although there are some schools that tend to front load their packages. So they give you a big package freshman year to get you there and then start, starts, uh, starts falling away. But of course, by that time, your kid doesn't want to leave because they have their friends and like their classes and like their dorm room and blah, 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 and you're kind of stuck. So it does happen, yes. Uh, I'll ask some questions, like the presidential scholarship. I think the, the, at times you give explanations like it's good for four years yep. every year as long as you maintain a three two Q. So, so like right. some of them are just for a year, and that's right. what we're experiencing. But some of them are good for four years as long as you maintain. Schools are a little bit better at telling you which ones are renewable, but they don't always. So you have to be sure to ask the question. Also, you'll notice two things on here. They could have very different requirements. So one scholarship might have a GPA requirement of 2.0, but the other one might have a requirement of 3.0 in major. So one of my friends and his son is about to graduate from Elon University in North Carolina. He had a $10,000 scholarship, among others, okay? But he was an economics major, College of Liberal Arts. <clears throat> Junior year, he wanted to switch to business, College of Business. He couldn't double major, so by Switching the major, now we knew this in advance, but by switching the major, his College of Liberal Arts $10,000 scholarship was going to go away just because he switched majors. But we knew in advance, so we were able to plan around it. But those things happen. So part of the strategy, especially for you senior parents, 
is understanding what the requirements actually are. Because you don't, again, you don't want to unintentionally, oh yeah, switch your major, and poof, there goes the money. Right? That's no fun. If you don't get money initially, is there a chance to get money next year or subsequent years? There's always a chance, but it becomes progressively unlikelier. Unless your student does really, really well. There are scholarships, and each school will miss their scholarships. Um, so there could be a scholarship like high-performing college sophomore in this major. They do exist, okay? Um, but out of the gate for something like this, probably not. Okay. Right. This one here, and we're going to spend a little time. So Hofstra, again, in this case, does a really good job sort of uh, putting on the loans. Um, so you'll notice two versions here. These are the direct loans. We will talk more about this, but this, this is the student loan directly to your son or daughter. No cosigner needed. You'll notice two flavors up there, subsidized versus unsubsidized. What that simply means is subsidized. While they're in school, no payments are required. Interest does not accrue. Unsubsidized, while they're in school, no payments required, but interest does accrue. Now, college, now high school senior parents, just because no payments are required doesn't mean you can't still make some payments. Right? You want to throw 50 bucks at it just to keep the interest accrual down? You can do that. Okay, that's fine. And if you don't have it one month, then don't make the payment. It wasn't required anyway. Okay, but these are to the student. We'll get into this a little bit more later. If you okay. do that, then, you know, pay, <coughs> to the uh, so if you make a payment, is it directed to the interest? The answer to that is always is always money gets applied to interest first before principal. Always. Okay. How about that? Okay. And again, students legal bar, they borrow this on their own. So if they don't pay the loans, that does not impact your credit at all. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, so you'll notice um, if you qualify for subsidized loans, the maximum per year is $3,500. All right. Um, but that is a need-based federal program. So if you don't have it on an award letter, that, doesn't, that just means that you didn't get it. And there's nothing you can really say or do about it afterwards. But if you got it, it's a great thing to have. Okay. Yeah, the subsidized portion, right. The unsubsidized portion, anybody can get, right. So whether, so whether the school wants you or not, whether or not you make a million dollars, whatever the case, anybody and their dog can get the unsubsidized loan. Yep, so, so there are legal limits on how much students can borrow. So the total between sub and unsub, okay, the total of those two is 5,500 freshman year, 6,500 sophomore, 7,500 junior, 7,500 senior. If you add up those numbers, it's $27,000 with a total program maximum of $31,000. So if they needed to go an extra semester or something, they can borrow another $4,000 unsub under the program. So this program is not the cause of the news stories where you see, oh, this kid graduated college with $200,000 of debt. It's not from this. Hey, the amounts are relatively small. Okay. And we'll talk more about this a little bit. Another form of financial aid is work study. And this is also a need-based thing. So some of you may have it, some of you may not, depending on your finances. Okay? Work study is simply they get a job on campus. And most of the time when you call a college and one of the departments, the first person answers the phone, usually it's a work study kit. Right? Now different schools will handle this differently. Um, okay, and typically it's on campus job. So some schools will expect a student to earn and then essentially hand that money over to the bursar's office to make a payment on the tuition bill. I can tell you my son's case at UMass, my son has work study. Um, he works as an usher at the Mullen Center where the hockey team, basketball team, and concerts are. Um, he's never paid any of his earnings to the bursar's office 
and he does make minimum wage, right, 12 bucks an hour right now, uh, to the point where he just turned 21, and his birthday is right before New Year's, so he and his buddies this past New Year's, this is pretty good, they actually rented an Airbnb right in downtown Boston, right by Faneuil Hall, to celebrate his birthday and New Year's Eve, and they could just walk everywhere. And the best part of all, he didn't ask me for any money. Like, it was perfect. Right? He, he all, everything he paid for was from his own earnings. I'm like, knock yourself out then. So, um, you know. <laughs> well, I could have done that too. Um, the only thing it really cost me was I, um, uh, I got him some beer. I got him, I, I, my wife and I did a little trip at that time out to Ohio, and I bought him a bunch of like craft beer from Ohio, and we drove back like a case of beer, and I, that was his 21st birthday present. <clears throat> That's all it cost me. Not a bad deal. Again, it's a need-based program, so again, you, if you have it, great. If you don't, you don't. There's nothing really to argue about here. Um, if you have it, you're not required to take it. So, if you, so you know, if you get it for your son or daughter, and they just and you and they decide, I don't want to work because I really want to focus on my studies or I'm doing sports or whatever, you can turn that portion of the aid down. But then you'll be responsible for whatever the dollars are. Okay. The other options on here. So in this case, again. Um, Hofstra lists out some of the other ways to pay. We'll talk about some of these. Um, and they list out the net benefit right there. The net bill after all this is 26,005. Senior parents, just be aware. So one of the things schools will do to kind of trick you into thinking how affordable school is, is they'll automatically assume that you're gonna finance that 26,500 using a plus loan. So that at the bottom of the financial aid letter, they can put a big fat zero dollars amount due. Right? Because it's zero out of pocket because you're borrowing everything else you need. So that's part of the games that schools will play on their financial aid letter to make it look good. Okay? Now, whether you borrow that way or not, it's up to you, but they will do it. I've seen that plenty of times myself. Okay? So any questions on this so far? Okay. So I want to quickly review some of the different ways to pay. Um, just some of the different options, and now I want to get into strategies. Um, but before I do that, so the uh, I want to talk about financial aid sort in general filing. So those of you who have juniors, right? So in the fall of their senior years, when you fill out the financial aid form, okay. That financial aid form will be based on your income from the most recently completed tax return. So this will be fall of 2019, okay? Based on your most recently completed tax return, which will be from 2018. So what that means for junior parents is the year that income counts is passed. You can't go back and change it. However, your assets, your bank accounts, right? The things that you own and the value of those things are as of the day of the day you fill out the form. So if you have a million dollars in the bank the day before you fill out the form, what you want to do is call me and let me hold on to it for you. <laughs> I was doing this workshop last year here in the fall and and so I, I said that, and, uh, and someone did ask, so Jack, does that mean that if the day before we fill out the form, I go to the bank, I take out the money, I shove it under my mattress, and then fill out the form the next day, could I legitimately put that zero in the bank? To which I said, leave your address. I'm gonna swing by that night. You don't have to be home. Just leave your door unlocked, it's fine. No problems, right, no problems. Right, I'll just swing by, okay? Um, yeah, so for those of you who have juniors, um, you have some strategies where it may make some sense to do some, some asset shifting. For those of you with sophomores or younger, the base year, the year of income that counts is the calendar year that spans spring of your sophomore year, spring of high school sophomore, into that summer, into the fall of junior year. That is the calendar year 
that counts. So if you have time, so if you, for those of you with sophomores now, you're in your base year. And so what that means is on paper, you want to look incredibly poor. Now remember I told you at the beginning, there are ways that people unintentionally kill their own chances for aid. I'll give you one of those examples. So I met a couple years ago with a family in Bill Rickham. <clears throat> they did not become clients because the mom just totally did not like what I told them. But it's kind of like this time of year. <clears throat> and I sat down with them and their daughter was a sophomore, so they're in their base year. And the mom happens to mention to me, you know what, we're gonna sell our house because we need a bigger house. I said, okay, great. You sell your house, how much are you gonna make on it? Oh, we're gonna make about 100,000, but we're gonna take that 100,000 and we're gonna roll it in to the, to the new house. It's now payment. I said, okay, great. Right, and for those of you who understand tax law, if you have a capital gain of 500,000 or less, married couple, right, on your primary residence, that gain is excluded from taxes. So $100,000 gain is gonna be completely tax-free as far as the IRS was concerned. But for financial aid purposes, it was gonna look like that their income was $100,000 higher in their base year, in the year that counts. And when your income is $100,000 higher, it wipes out potentially twenty-five to $30,000 in aid. And because many schools budget across the years, that $100,000 sale transaction would actually cost somewhere between $100,000 and $120,000 of aid cumulatively over the four years. So I told that mom, I said, look, your best bet is to basically, you know, again, it's this time of year, right, you know, February, March. If you want to move, but you don't want to kill your, own, your kids' own chances for aid, wait until January 1st of the following year, right? Now you're outside that calendar year, then sell the house, and then it doesn't matter. Right? And they didn't have any younger kids, right? If you have younger kids, this sort of window, you then have to sort of watch out for your younger kids, but they didn't have any younger kids. So wait till January 1st of the following year, and then sell your house, and, and then you won't have this problem. Well, she didn't really like that answer because she wants to move sooner. I'm like, hey, fine. And again, all the other parents whose child is going to go to the same school as your parents, they all say thank you. <laughs> okay. So it's stuff like that. We're drawing from your 401k. We're drawing out of IRAs, selling stock, getting a bonus award to the extent you can control it. Right? You want to be very careful about these things because seemingly innocuous financial transactions can easily wipe out your chances for aid. Yes? So based on that story, it's just that there are sort of ranges of income level that will affect your ability to get aid. Correct. Um, can you share what those are? Can you give us a point or two where we can find that out? Yeah, so okay, so great question. So ranges of income levels are how it affects aid. So, um, so aid, when you fill out the financial aid form, okay, for some colleges, they only use one form, it's the FAFSA. For other colleges, they use two forms, the FAFSA plus what's called a profile form. Okay, so a lot of your private schools around here are Harvard, MIT, BC, BU, Holy Cross, St. A, Stonehill, WPI, Wellesley, those, those schools use both forms. And at the end of the day, all they do is they take your information and they apply a formula to it. And once they apply that formula, it results in a number called your EFC, expected family contribution. Okay, that expected family contribution is how much the college thinks you can afford per year for college. College, make no mistake, is the only thing we buy as a consumer, is the only thing we buy as a consumer where the seller tells us how much we can afford. Whether you can actually afford it or not is completely irrelevant to the argument. And it counts your income, it counts your assets, but it does not count your debt. So you can be up to your eyeballs in credit card debt and they don't care. Okay, they don't. That's just the way the formula works. All right, I can say that the formula is far heavier on income than it is on assets. So if you make, you know, random, if you make $100,000 family income, okay, and $20,000 in assets, you know, between the bank account and whatever, the $20,000 almost doesn't matter. 
It's your $100,000 in income that's going to drive the number. Okay. Um, so a lot of times when, when I run into situations, people will, you know, you're going to hear stories like, oh, should I save my kid's name? Should I bury it in the backyard? Should I do this? Should I do that? Well, if you have a really high income, no matter what asset you bury, you're probably not really going to help yourself because, again, it's driven far heavier on income than it is on assets. So some of those strategies don't really help. Okay? But once you get the EFC number, whatever that number may be, you compare that against the cost of attendance. And that determines your eligibility for need. So if the school costs $70,000, but your EFC is $40,000, you're eligible for $30,000 in need. And if that's the situation, you want to maintain that gap or even grow that gap. So switching assets or deferring gains or whatever on your income would really matter. But on the other hand, if the school is $30,000 a year, but your EFC is 50, you're not eligible for any aid. So all those strategies don't matter. And in fact, you actually want to save and pay for school in a completely different way. So in those cases, when people say to you, hey, should I save my kid's name? Yeah, go ahead, because it doesn't matter. You're not getting aid anyway. In fact, in some of those cases, you may want to save your kid's name. Why? Lower tax rates. So there's a lot of strategy for this. So, so when you're looking at, so for those of you with younger parents, one of the first steps I encourage you, younger parents, younger students, sorry. The first step I encourage you to do is there's plenty of online calculators to calculate EFC. Get a rough ballpark of what your number is and compare that against some schools. And I'm going to tell you, this is, this is real life. This is how I handle the clients. Because then people ask me, well, what should I save in? What should I do? Well, if you're going to be in line for need, because the school's price is up here and your EFC is down here, that leads to one set of strategies. But if it's the other way and you're not in line for lead, it leads to a completely different set of strategies. And when I work with people, I tell them, I can't even tell you what strategy you should use until I know your EFC. Because it's sort of the dividing point. Right? Okay. Oh, by the way, I'm going to just quickly go back to this. And I know I'm giving you a lot of information, and your head's probably spinning. Um, when you go on tours, junior parents, which I always encourage you to do, this actually happened to my son at Endicott. So he's walking with the, the associate dean of admissions, I don't know, some, some guy. And, and when, when you take a tour with the staff member, the staff member is going to ask my son, so what's your GPA? And my son told him. What's your SAT score? And my son told him. Well, in that moment, okay, of course, they never tell you this, but in the moment, that, that director of admissions already knew if my son was going to get in or not. Already knew. Based on that. Based, Based on that, right? Okay. Already knew. Of course, he, he wasn't going to tell my son, right? The language is, well, you know, with a kid similar to your scores, you, prob you probably have a pretty good shot of getting in. Okay, great. So fast forward a few steps, or walking around campus, and then the guy says, well, probably with a kid around your score, you probably, you probably, if you get in, would be eligible for like a $20,000 scholarship. Of course, my son thinks this is phenomenal, right? Would you like to take a guess as to what the average scholarship at Endicott is? $20,000. So the guy knew, based on my son's scores, he was going to get in, right? It was kind of average. And they give kids, average kids, $20,000. So he's very comfortable saying, oh, yeah, you'd be in line for $20,000. But of course, they do that because they sucker you, right? Because it sounds awesome in the moment. So my son comes home like, Dad, Dad, you're never going to guess what the guy told me, right? And I, and I listen. I'm like, wow, that's great. Until I looked it up, I'm like, yeah, not so good. <clears throat> These things happen. What? I know, I know. I totally just pff, deflated that balloon. I know. I know, terrible, terrible dad. Um, you fill out that one financial aid form, and then you know ahead of applying for financial aid to individual schools? Right, so you fill out the one form and you send it to all the schools where your son or daughter is going to apply to. Okay. But at right. that point, you already know what your. Um, you would know your EFC. You would know your EFC. Right. But you know your EFC at least. Through one of the online calculators. Like online well, from the form, as soon as right? I sent in my form, I got a letter coming back. This is your EFC. Right. Oh, oh, really? They do that now. 
years ago, um, the EFC used to be a small six, it's a small six digit number, no dollar sign, no decimal point, so it looks like a code, okay? And so it's easy to miss. If you're interested, I, I, actually, I actually wrote for the Westford newspaper a, horror, a true horror story where um, only because I knew what to look for a couple years ago, I knew the mom's EFC was $20,000, so it's six digits, right? So it would have been 020000 for 20,000. We did our FAFSA and everything else and came back 200000, meaning it came back as 200,000. Caught it right away, luckily, because had she let that go through, the school would have thought that she could afford $200,000 a year and the kid would not have gotten any aid whatsoever. Each of us say is you look at the EFC number versus what the school gives. It is, like, does it say you can only afford $2,000? They're not going to fill that gap all the time. Right, no. no. So they can still say, give me $20,000, even though yep. your EFC is $2,000. Right. Yep. So we're going to go over a couple of these uh, payment options. We're going to go into a little bit more in depth. Um, again, Again, more for senior parents, but junior parents, you can start kind of thinking about this because there are a lot of strategies around this. So one way to pay the college bill is you can set up a, pay a monthly payment plan. So these are screenshots from different schools. You can typically manage it online. You can decide how much you want to put towards that payment plan. And the payment plan actually is the least costliest option because there's no interest. There might be like a one-time setup charge 50 bucks, 80 bucks, whatever, but there's no interest. And some schools allow you to pick how many months you want to do. Other schools don't, okay? And you can see this one gives you 10 months and there's a $65 one-time enrollment fee. But it's pretty simple. And so um, you can do this, you can add more money to it each year, you can take away each year and then the remaining payments will just adjust accordingly, right? So it's actually one of the easier ways to go if you want to pay part of your tuition bill that way. Not a bad deal. Okay. Yeah. This is typical, sorry. Yep. This isn't, so this is, there's no long-term referral here. It's all payment within the calendar. It's payment, it's payment within the academic year. Academic yeah. Year. You're not paying at all in half the things me in August, and the other half six months later, you're paying it more incrementally, but more also at the same time. You're paying it pretty much during the academic year. Right, um, and of course that's just based on what you can handle for monthly payment, and that's it's up to you to decide. Okay, but it's an option. Savings plans. So this is where things start to get a little bit complicated. Remember, schools and the financial aid works on a calendar year basis, but we tend to think of things on an academic year basis. So I gave you the example with the selling the house, right? But sometimes people say, well, I have some stock. I'll sell that. Well, when you sell that, if you incur capital gains, same type of thing happens, okay? Um, also, in particular, 529 plan withdrawals. Depending on how you time it, your withdrawal could be taxable, even though you used for college. And because the IRS measures it on an academic year. So I'm gonna give you kind of a quick example. And usually I do this kind of on a whiteboard, it's easier to see. But I'll give you an example. So let's suppose the college bill is $20,000. 10,000 in fall, 10,000 in spring, okay? For freshman year. You have money in a 529 plan. You, and remember, the IRS looks at it on a calendar year. So for you senior parents, you're gonna have a bill in the fall, right? So you take out $10,000 during the summer to pay the fall tuition bill. There's $10,000 in qualified expenses against a $10,000 529 withdrawal, tax-free withdrawal, you're all set. But what some people do is they say, well, you know what? I know I owe $10,000 for the fall and I owe $10,000 for the spring. Instead of taking two withdrawals, maybe over the summer, I'll just take as one big withdrawal. I'll just take all $20,000 out. And even if you send in all $20,000, that makes it taxable. Because in the calendar year, there's only $10,000 of qualified expenses. But you took out 20,000. 
So $10,000 of that withdrawal is non-taxable. The other that $20,000 now becomes taxable. And because you did not have offsetting qualified expenses, you're also subject to a 10% withdrawal penalty. Now you can do that. The IRS does give you a window plus minus three months year end. So if you did the same trick, but you did it, let's say October one, you're in the window, so you're fine, right? Or if you did like February one, you're in the plus minus three months in the window, you're fine. But like if you took, in that example, if you took all $20,000 in June, you're not in the three month window, right? Very easy to fall in that trap. So you go along, tuition bills are paid, right? And the college doesn't care, right? They don't do your taxes, they got their money. What happens is later on, you get a nasty note from the IRS, oh, by the way, you owe us a bunch of taxes and a 10% penalty on this. <clears throat> Gotta watch out for those things, <clears throat> okay? Qualified expenses are things like tuition room board fees, computer equipment, um, up to, up, and the room and board is up to the school cost. So historically, when kids are now juniors in college, they tend to live off campus, right? They get their own off-campus apartment. Or you like my son, he decided to live in a frat house this year, yay. Um, <clears throat> that still counts as long as the cost of that outside housing does not exceed the allocation for what the school calculates for a dorm room and board. So if the school says there's $10,000 of room and board, but your kid's outside apartment's $11,000, you have $10,000, what's called qualified expenses, and the extra thousand is just on you. What you cannot use 529 plan money for or any of the tax credits for is student health insurance. That's always gonna be on the first bill each year to the tune of about 700 bucks. You can waive it as soon as you show proof of insurance, like if your son or daughter's on your own insurance, you'll then take it right off the bill. But you can't use 529 plan money for that. You can't use it for travel expenses. So if your son or daughter is going far away to school, you can't use it to buy airline tickets or bus tickets. And you can't use it for loan payments. So one of the questions I often get asked is why well, have all this 529 plan money for an older child, should I, you know, should I use it up front? Should I use it at the end? Should I save it for my second child? Whatever. There's no necessarily right or wrong answer, but what you want to avoid is you don't want to get stuck in a situation where there's money left over and all you have are loan payments because they can't use it for that. Okay. Actually, with the cost of college these days, it's probably not going to happen, but still. Theoretically. <clears throat> the direct loans we touched upon earlier, student is the borrower. It's a fixed rate for the life of the loan, but the rate can change each year. So what that means is they take out the loan this year, it's a 5.05 fixed rate and it's fixed for the life of that loan. But next year as a sophomore, when they take out the loan, the rate might be 6% and it'll be fixed for the life of that loan. And then junior year interest rates go down to 4% and it's 4% fixed for the life of that loan, so on and so forth. So each year's disbursement might have a different rate, but the interest rate will never change on that particular loan, okay? We talked about the limits per year, how much you can borrow. That was the 55, 65, 75, 75, okay? No payments are required during school and there are multiple repayment options. And this right here is one of the best features of federal student loans. <clears throat> because if you think about, for those of you who have a mortgage today, if you have a 15 year mortgage, but let's say you lost your job or your hours got cut back or, or whatever, God forbid, and you need to lower your payment. Well, the only way to do that is if you refinance, let's say to 30 years, right? You can't just decide on your own, hey, bank, I'm just gonna send you less money. Well, federal student loans, you're allowed to change the payment plan at any time for any reason for no cost. So you can get very, very creative in terms of how you manage this. So you can start out with the 10-year standard, then go to income base the next month, then go to the extended, then switch to graduate, and then when your kid lands a full-time job, high-paying job, they go back to standard. You can change that every month like this, okay? The other thing about federal student loans, especially if you get subsidized loans, okay, especially if you have subsidized loans, remember subsidized loans means that interest does not accrue while they're in school. 
but let's suppose your son or daughter is out of school and they're working now. They could be years out of school, but they lose their job, right? They get laid off or whatever, for whatever reason. They have the legal right to put the loans back into deferment, so no payments are required. But if some of those loans are subsidized loans and they put them back into deferment, interest doesn't accrue, just like when they were in school. So when I work with clients to manage student loans, like it's like you do not touch subsidized loans, right? You pay everything else off first, you do not touch it for that reason and that reason alone. Because you can't get that feature anywhere else. And once you refinance out into private loans, because Citizens Bank is running a lot of commercials right now, once you refinance into private loans, you can't go back. Plus loans. This is, yes? Is the max on an interest rate on either one of those loans? There is no max on the interest rate for either one of those loans. The rate is set every July 1, right, government fiscal year, July 1, June 30th. So typically the rate for each new year is, um, comes out like in the springtime, like winter to springtime, if it's going to change. Um, having said that, it's a federal program. So um, the rate only goes up if interest rates in general go up, right? But, but otherwise, they don't need a cosigner, they don't need a credit history, they don't need a job, they can still borrow it, it's a great deal. And I personally always recommend it because it's your student's stake in the game. But that's an opinion more than anything else. Plus loans. This is parents, this is for you. Your version of the student loan. You're the legal borrower, so you're on the hook. You don't pay, your credit gets wrecked. The fixed rate's 7.6 with, with a lot higher point. Again, the rate is fixed for life, but can change each year, right? So again, this year it's this, next year it might be something else. Okay. You can borrow up to the cost of attendance with basically no credit check. So that means if your son or daughter got into, what's, what's expensive? NYU. NYU for $75,000 and you didn't want to have your kid take on any debt, but you want to borrow $75,000, you can do that. And by the way, there's no credit check, which means you can have a 350 credit score, be jobless, and on the verge of living under a bridge. You can still borrow. <laughs> hey, and there's some nice bridges in town, right? We'll see you there. But you can still borrow. Now, I, of course, I don't recommend that, but you can do it. You can defer payments during school. You don't have to, but I generally require. And same thing, interest will accrue. There's no subsidized version of the plus loan. So interest will accrue, but again, you can throw payments at it during school if you want, okay? No requirement. And you also have multiple repayment plans. So again, it gives you a ton of flexibility, okay? All right, any questions so far on this? So would it be better for the students to follow? <coughs> Bless you. What's that? Would it be better for the students to borrow the subsidized loan? If they get it. Well, unsubsidized loan, but instead of paying the school, invest in the stock market? Would it be better to borrow and then instead of paying the school, invest in the stock market? Um, you know, that's kind of an interesting question. The, the general answer to that is no. But, the, but I have actually had situations where that actually can work. I'll talk about that in, in the strategies. Um, it, it's not everybody, and I don't recommend it, except in very specific circumstances, but it actually can, because I've actually seen it work. <clears throat> yes? You mentioned student loans, you said if they get it. What would prevent a student from getting it? Oh, sorry. So um, uh, what would prevent a student from getting a loan is if they're no longer in good standing, so if they like on the verge of flunking out, and it doesn't have to be flunking out. Uh, generally, you have to maintain at least a 2.0 to qualify for federal student aid, and um, you can't get arrested, like no drug offenses. Um, so you want to open a pot shop, le pot shop legally? You can do that. Get caught with it illegally, you're right. You're out of the program. You're out of the pool. Yes. When it says can defer payments during school, does that mean during the academic year, or does that mean at the end of the four years you would stop? 
at the end of the four years. Right. Yep. Yep. Great questions. OK. Let's talk a little about private loans. So um, private loans, uh, so in this area, you have some major lenders. Citizens Bank is a big player. DCU is a big player. MIFA, the people who do the high school workshops, they're a big player. Okay. <clears throat> What's interesting about the private loans is you actually have a choice of who borrows. So you, again, you can get very creative here. So you can borrow as a parent, or you can have your son or daughter borrow. Now, here's the thing. They're not going to have a credit history or a job. So if your son or daughter borrows, you're going to have to co-sign. But it, it opens up some interesting possibilities. And I'll go to that in just a moment. But with private loans, you can pick fixed or variable rate. Okay. You have, but it's full underwriting. So this is now you need a good credit score. They're going to check to see if you have a job that actually pays you. Right? Are you able to pay it back? Right? All that stuff counts now. Okay? And there's multiple payment options during school, and I'll go over that in just a moment. Right? But because it's a private lender, they generally want their money back in a shorter period of time. So you don't have some long terms that you could with a federal loan if you wanted it. Just to give you an example, okay, so here, interest rate could be fixed or variable, but during school, private loans, you can either do defer payments, so no payments, you can go interest only, IO, or you can go full payments starting day one. It's up to you, you can choose, all right? Repayment plans, you can see payment terms. Now, keep in mind that when you look at the Citizens Bank commercial right now, they'll advertise like, oh yeah, the interest rate's 3% or whatever, and it sounds awesome. SoFi, same thing. But in order to get the lowest rate, to get the lowest rate, you have to have the best credit. You're picking a variable rate. You're starting full payments day one. And you generally have to pay back within five years. But they'll give you a low rate for that. If you actually match the terms of the private loan to as close as possible to what you get on a plus loan, the interest rate is almost as high, if not higher if you truly match apples for apples on a private. Okay. But that deferment now is very interesting. Again, I hope that your son, you or your sons or daughters don't ever get laid off or whatever. But with federal student loans, that's a legal right baked into the contract. You can ask for forgive, uh, forbearance or deferment if you lose your job, if you get disabled, whatever. But that's not necessarily true with a private loan. So imagine today if you lost your job and you call up Citizens Bank, hey, by the way, I lost my job. I can't send you any payments for a while. What do you think they're going to say? Right? We still want our money. Now, some private loans also do offer deferment, but they have limits. So for example, one company says right in their terms and condition, we will give you 12 months worth of deferment for the life of the loan. So if you take on the loan and then you lose your job for 12 months and you use up that 12-month clock and you start payments again, but let's say a couple years down the road you lose your job again and you call for a deferment, you can't get it anymore because you've used up the time they've allotted you. Now for some people that's really important, others it's not, but I point it out because it is an important feature. Okay. Question, yes? Can the federal loan be deferred if the student goes to grad school? Yeah. Can the federal loan be deferred? Yeah. Yep. So if, if your student, let's say, graduates from undergrad, works for a couple years, they would start payment, and then they go back to grad school, they can put the loans back into deferment. Yep. If, if, if they want, right? They're not required to, but they can. Okay. The other thing also is on federal loans, there is a potential for forgiveness. Um, I wouldn't really bank on that these days, but there are things like public service loan forgiveness, teacher forgiveness, and also just sort of a you pay us long enough, we'll let you off the hook after 25 years forgiveness. Um, we'll see if those programs survive. The private loans have an interesting feature, though, many of them. They have a potential cosigner release. And generally how that works is if you cosign for your child, they go through school, they then graduate, and there's three or four years of on-time payments and your child is gainfully employed full time and their credit score is above a certain number, you can actually apply to have you completely released off that loan. And for parents who do that, I'll say, 
hey, if your kid can't make the payments, you make the payments because you want that three years to go by, right? <clears throat> so, but that's an option. That's an option. And just keep in mind also that when we talk about paying for school, right, whether it's borrowing or payment plans or cash up front or something, there's a lot of strategies. So just because if you're going to use loans, it doesn't mean that you can't help make the payments later. So if you want to put all the debt on your kid, you can do that. And then when they start payments, you can help them with some of the payments. That's OK. Right? A lot of ways to go on this. Okay. Any qu oh, any questions so far? Yes, sir. Uh, maybe I missed this, but do I understand that if the student wants to take out a loan, he, the student can take out a, a federal loan? Yes. But the limit is only $5,500 or maybe, $5, maybe $6,000? Is that that's all I could get on the federal loan? So is the limit $5,500 for a student direct loan freshman year? The answer to that is yes. One year? The one year, and then $6,500 the second year, and then seventy-five and seventy-five. The reason it goes up gradually is because everybody knows, the federal government knows, that if students are likely to drop out, they're going to drop out freshman year. So if you're like, more likely to drop out freshman year, they're not going to let you borrow as much and get yourself in trouble. In fact, if you really want to get into the whole one, one of the causes of this whole like debt, student debt crisis and how students end up with a lot of debt, it's actually it's kids who borrow and don't finish. So they don't get the benefit of getting a higher paying job because they have the college degree. But now because they're out of school, they have to start paying. And a lot of times because they end up working wherever and they can't make the payments, interest starts accruing, 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 blah, 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 and there you go. So that's why they limit the amount of freshman year because if you're going to drop, you're going to drop freshman year. In all likelihood, they're going to have to have other loans. Right. Other than well, and right, so in all likelihood, the student will have to have other loans or other ways to pay. And the answer to that is it's true, but they can't borrow anymore on their own. That's where you, as parents or grandparents, have to come into the picture, either with plus loans, private loans, and cosign, or you have other resources like cash, right, or whatever. Okay? Now, it's not up here, but I do want to just talk quickly about other strategies for borrowing. So, for example, home equity. People have said to me, well, I'll just borrow using my home equity. That's fine. That's up to you. Generally, the rate's pretty low. You may even already have a line of credit available. But just remember, if you do that, payments are going to start day one, right, as soon as you make that draw. Right? And also keep in mind that now with the, under the new tax code, your interest on that is no longer tax deductible because you're using the proceeds for a non-residential real estate purpose. You did not use the money to acquire or improve your real estate because you used it for college. Interest no longer tax deductible. But that's an option. Some people will do that. Other people will say, well, I might borrow from my 401k. You can do that. Okay. But anybody know what the limits are in the 401k? How much you can borrow? It's an IRS rule. So even if you have a million dollars in your 401k, a 401k loan can be no more than $50,000 or 50% of the balance, whichever is less, and it is a five-year payback. So if you have a million-dollar 401k balance, the most you can borrow, $50,000, one loan at a time. Right? So you can't borrow $50,000 freshman year and then borrow $50,000 sophomore year and so on and so forth. Right? The total outstanding is $50,000 or 50% 50 of the balance, whichever is less. I don't recommend that anyway. Okay. Some people use credit cards, you know, depending. They'll use, you know, they get points or something, right? I've, I've seen people put, uh, uh, put it on their credit card for like a semester. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's up to you. Um, you know, and if you have the cash to then sort of pay it off, then, then do that. I mean, that's okay. But there are other options. All right. Questions so far? Okay. Let's talk strategies. Generally speaking, this is more for senior parents, but generally speaking, here's what I recommend. You want your son or daughter to take full advantage scholarships as well as outside scholarships. So these are the ones. There's scholarship search engines out there. Fastweb.com, scholarships.com. College Board website has a search engine right on, that, on its own website. US Department of Education has a scholarship search engine. 
Now, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you, it's a giant pain in the rear end, even with filters, to search and sort through, but it can be very lucrative if you spend the time. It's right on the, if you, if you Google uh, uh, federal student aid, it'll pull up the federal student aid website and the one of the menus will have scholarship search. But you can also look at different sources. So for example, local foundations. So uh, Greater Lowell Community Foundation has a couple scholarships for kids from Chelmsford. There's an organization, a nonprofit out there that I partner with a lot called Get There, Start Now. They give scholarships for kids throughout the entire Merrimack Valley. Your own company that you work for might have a scholarship program, right, for children and employees. Right, different youth organizations, and some of these are Naviance, but like Shumser Youth Baseball, I know for years, has a scholarship, right? Um, there was, what was the one, um, there was a, like, you know, and there's all sorts of random ones. I mean, there's like one that's like duct tape, right? If you like go to the prom in a dress made out of duct tape, you can submit your photo, went up to like 25,000. Um, you know, there's, there's stuff like that. There's even one, there's even one scholarship out there. I, have, I, I found it one time looking. Um, it was like $10,000, but how you apply for it was you had to send in the rejection letters from all of the other scholarships you had to apply for because they really wanted students to kind of take this, right, take this initiative. So the more rejection letters you got, the better chance you got of winning this one. <clears throat> There's a lot for different, I mean, again, different, well, different scholarships will have different focuses, so some will be for minorities. Um, it, you just have to look for it. Also, um, some schools, their alumni associations will have scholarships. So I know my alma mater, University of Texas, right? The Texas X's Alumni Association, they give out one full ride scholarship a year to an out state kid. Now, granted, it's only one, but still, Right? I mean, well, it's like 45,000 bucks. Might as well take a swing, right? So, you know, you can do that. And again, for your younger children, that search starts now, yes, right? Now. Yes. So how does that work if you have a younger student, or even the junior, if they apply for a scholarship now? What happens? Like, does it defer until when it goes to college or if they go to college? Um, so what happens if you actually win one, right? Um, it depends on the scholarship. So the scholarship sometimes will send the money directly to the school, fine. So if your son or daughter is a junior, they'll send it in later. Sometimes they send the check to you, which really, for me, is kind of the preferred method. Um, yeah, usually those are the two, two differences, right? So, uh, but, but every scholarship will handle that a little bit differently. So you just, every scholarship will tell you sort of how they do it. Yep, yes. <laughs> Great question. So, how are basically how are outside scholarships treated for out, FAFSA? So here's so here's the deal. Um, every school is a little bit different in terms of how they treat outside scholarships, and this also gets back to whether or not those scholarships send it directly to the school. Or they send it to you, because if they send it to you, I didn't get anything. Did I, Dennis? Did you get? I didn't. I didn't get. I didn't get anything in the mail. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. But if they send it to the school, you're kind of out of luck, right? So here's the way it kind of works. So let's suppose that when it's all said and done with loans and everything else and scholarships, you still have like a $20,000 gap. And you go out and get $5,000 in outside scholarships. Because the amount did not cover the entire gap, most schools will say, fine, you owe us 15,000 bucks, done. However, if let's say you get 20,000, or 25,000 in outside scholarships. So now you actually got more than you needed. What schools will start to do is they'll start to pull back some of their own aid. But every school will pull it back in a different order. Some schools will pull back loans first and then scholarships. Other schools will pull scholarships then loans or anything else. So every school is a little bit different in how they treat that. And some schools don't pull back at all. So it really varies. Good question. Yes. When you say the younger kids can start now, do you mean in the search or do you mean actual application? Both. Both, really? So yep. Okay. Eighth grade, eighth grade, freshman year. Anything younger than that, you can't do it, but by eighth grade to freshman year, you can start. 
Um, it used to, I'll just give you one example. So uh, out in Marlboro or something, there used to be like a North Central Home Show. Um, it runs every year, and a couple years ago they had, if you attended the show and you wrote like a, an essay about like homes or sustainability or something, they gave out two $1,000 scholarships. Like if you went to the show and then submitted, you know, and then afterwards submitted an application. Uh, one year they had two applicants. They gave out two $1,000 scholarships and had two applicants. The kid could like scribble like X <laughs> and still want it, right? You don't want to pass that up. Yes? Along the line, I'm answering, are 529 funds truly invisible for colleges? Are 529 funds invisible to colleges? The answer to that is no. Right? 529s count in the financial aid formula just like if they were in your bank. And so just quickly on that, so one of the questions I get is, well, I have two kids and I have a 529 account for each kid. Will both accounts count for financial aid purposes? And the question I ask back to my clients in those situations is, how are the accounts titled legally? Who is the legal owner? Because it matters. 99% of the time, the parents are the legal owner, but you designate each kid as a beneficiary. Well, because you're the legal owner, both accounts count. It doesn't matter that one, one is for this kid and one is for this kid. You own it, it counts, end of story. But the child's the legal owner, then it changes, right? So if the child's the legal owner and kid A is the one applying for financial aid, then only that one counts but it counts to a higher degree. Well, it depends on the school. But it can count to a higher degree. The account for kid B, if kid B's the legal owner, but kid A is the one filing for financial aid, kid B's 529 plan won't be there. So do you have up until the day you fill out that application, or is it that year that you were talking about, the year of your phone? Someone's thinking. Someone, you have up until the day before. Okay, okay, good. Okay. Now, in the case of grandparent-owned 529 plans, they're completely invisible as an asset on the financial aid form. So if grandma and grandpa have $100,000 in 529 plans, save for little Johnny and Sally, it shows up nowhere in the financial aid form until they take out the money. And I'm going to go over that in just a moment. I'll talk to you what happens then. Okay? So outside scholarships first. Then I always recommend that you use savings or 529 money. Like if you have money already earmarked for college savings, sometimes people ask me, well, should I wait till the end because it might grow in the stock market? I say, you know what, use it up first, generally, okay? Yes? So if you have student 529, do you suggest taking it all for the first year or breaking it into four? Um, so, if you, so do I recommend taking it out across four years or just sort of taking it all at once? Um, my per again, every situation is different. My personal opinion is if you have enough and qualified expenses where you can take out the whole thing the first year, just, just pay it. But if you don't, then we talk about what happens with the taxes. Right? By the way, there is a rule about 529 plans. If you get a scholarship of, let's say, 1000 bucks, the rule said because now you don't have to use 529 plan money for that thousand bucks because you got a scholarship, you can take out a thousand dollars out of the 529 plan. Okay? However, you're allowed to do that. However, that withdrawal is still taxable if you don't have other qualified expenses. The rule simply states that you can take out from the 529 up to the amount of your scholarship and you don't have to pay the 10% withdrawal penalty but you still have to pay taxes on it. You just don't have to pay the 10%. Okay. <clears throat> Very complicated. Then I suggest you use direct loans. I'm a huge fan of direct loans. It's the kid's stake in the game. We talked about repayment options, loan forgiveness, deferment, all that stuff. After that, then comes you, right? And this is now as much a philosophical discussion as it is a financial discussion. Because for some of you, you might be morally opposed to debt, and so you want to put the rest of that college bill on the monthly payment plan, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Other people say, well, you know, I don't mind debt. I'll take it on, and that's fine. Right? Everybody's a little bit different. 
So let me share a couple of just strategies that I've used with clients. Okay, just as an example. And show the picture of the bridge, not because you're living under it. I show the bridge because in my, when, when I work with people, one of my favorite strategies is to use the PLUS loan, but as a bridge. So I was just talking with someone the other day. Hey, I want to put it on my home equity anyway. I already have the line of credit. Okay, great. Why not take advantage of the PLUS loan? You can throw money at it, and then you can pay it off afterwards, right? So when the loan becomes due, when your kid graduates, then put it on your home equity. You can do that. Or if you're going to refinance your entire mortgage to take cash out, well, you don't want to refinance every year, right? Do it at the end, right? But you can use the PLUS loan to sort of bridge the time to get to that point. You can also refinance out into private loans, right? Uh, there's even strategies, for example, where, um, uh, and again, I've seen the situation, you have you have some stock or some investments, not in a retirement account. But you know that if you sell them, it's gonna hit, cap hit capital gains, which is going to raise your income, which is going to affect your financial aid, right? Just like we talked about the house example. Well, that might be a scenario where you take out loans, wait till the day your kid graduates, then sell the stock, because at that point, capital gains don't matter. Take the proceeds, pay off the loans in one shot. That would be an example. Another example, right? and I've done this. We talk about stock market. I don't, I, don't, I don't recommend you do this with the stock market because you take on risk. But there are ways to do it. So I had a situation one time where a client, as, a, as part of a divorce settlement, got quite a bit of money. We actually invested that very conservatively. But we took out loans. Now, had she taken out loans, she could have paid, she had three daughters, she could have paid for about, about one and two thirds worth of kids. So she was gonna still end up having to borrow because there just wasn't enough cash to get through all three kids. However, it was enough cash for us to invest and have it grow. And then when the payments started after school, after the kids graduated, we were going to take out a little bit at a time only to make the payments. Right? So take enough money out to make the payment. She's going to turn around, send it into the loan servicer. But because you're not taking the whole chunk out, that the majority of that balance was still going to grow, and she was going to end up with far more money over the long run and have it available for retirement. So that is a strategy where something like we talked about can work in certain circumstances. I would never put in the stock market, but conceptually you can do it. Right? A lot of strategies. You can be very, very creative here in how you do this, right? Grandma and grandpa. Grandma and grandpa say, hey, I want to chip in $10,000 towards college, whether it's from a 529 plan or not. Well, if grandma and grandpa writes that check, $10,000 to the college directly, that $10,000 represents student income Student income is taxed at 50%, five zero, which means that $10,000 from grandma and grandpa just wiped out $5,000 in financial aid. So maybe what grandma and grandpa want to do is also use kind of, have the parents use kind of a loan strategy to bridge. And then when the payments start, right, grandma and grandpa, instead of sending in $10,000 into the college, they just send $10,000 straight to the loan servicer to pay off part of the debt. And when you do that, there's no financial aid impact because after the fact anyway. Right? <laughs> what about deposit on the 520? If our parents wanted to contribute $10,000, should they dump it into the 529? And then you could take it out as you need. So should the grandparents put the money into 520, into like the one that you own? Yeah. Grandma and grandpa could certainly do that, right? However, that $10,000 will inflate your 10, 529 plan balance by 10,000 bucks, which is no different than if grandma and grandpa put it into your bank account, which is going to impact aid a little bit. Yeah. So you're actually better off having grandma and grandpa keep it in their own account. 
and then pay it after the fact. Okay, a lot of strategies. So I personally am a huge fan of using plus loans, not because I want to keep it. I don't want to keep anybody in debt, right? I personally am a huge fan of using plus loans as that bridging strategy to make some of these other things happen. But again, everybody's different, right? If you're morally opposed to debt, don't do that. So yes. if the grandparents <coughs> had the 549, could they pay into that plus loan or is that? No, you can't use, you can't, you can't use plus, you can't use 529 money to make loan payments. Here's the, pro, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip that. So here's the challenge if the money is a grandparent-owned 529. And I pick on grandparents, but what I really mean is any extended family members, right? It could be aunts, uncles, cousins, nieces, nephews, whatever, but for the benefit of your child. If they take money out of the 529 plan to pay for college, right? We talked about that's student income, and it's assessed at a 5-0, 50% rate. Well, you don't want that. So what that tends to mean is if you think about the final year in undergrad, the final year you fill out the FAFSA is fall of junior year for college senior year. But if you do anything after that final FAFSA, it doesn't matter, right? All bets are off. So the optimal time to use a grandparent-owned 529 would be the day after you fill out the final FAFSA, fall of college junior year. Here's the problem. If grandma and grandpa have $200,000 in a 529 plan, and, you, and little Johnny only has one year to go, a year and a half to go, it's probably not $200,000, right? So you can't use up all the money. Now, grandma and grandpa could then save their graduate school, sure, or another kid or whatever, but you do run into some issues like that if there are substantial sums involved. What about if it's just because <coughs> I have kids two years apart and I have a brother who's interested in Uncle 549. Yep. So, and he was talking about uh, putting the money into my oldest son's final year of school, but would that affect my younger son's, you know, my younger son will son be halfway through, that will affect his back. So, so, so remember, if an if outside family member or anybody puts an extra money into 529, if you, the parent, are the legal owner, right, regardless of who the 529 plan is destined for, if you're the legal owner, it counts. I think it would be him. He was talking about setting it up on his own or for the kid. But. So, if he, so if your brother's the legal owner, then, yeah. then the balance would not count because it's outside the immediate family, but the same rules are applied when he takes the money out and pays it to the school. The same rules apply as grandma and grandpa with that. Okay. So again, you gotta be so part of paying for college, if you if you have some of these outside resources, a big part of this is timing, is understanding the rules around timing. And again, you know I told you, very easy to unintentionally blow up your chances for aid. This is what I'm telling you. Timing now becomes extremely important so you don't do that. Tax or untaxed income. So we talked about the capital gains, right? Here's the other thing. In your base year, right? So again, if your son or daughter is a sophomore now, right? This is your base year. So some people say, well, I'm going to make my income go down. How do you do that? I'm going to max out my 401k contribution. If anybody would ever like to see the calculation, I'm more than happy to show you. But don't do that unless you really want to save for retirement. Because when you do that, you actually, yes, your take home goes down, but it actually makes your financial aid income go up. So it actually leaves you worse off for financial aid, even though you're taking home less income. So, so now, if you max out your 401k contribution before your base year or after base year, that's up to you. But during, don't do it. Um, oh, by the way, same thing here, like things like child support, alimony if it's untaxed, uh, workman's comp, disability payments if it's untaxed, all those things count. And same thing also, just like 401k contributions, you say, well, I'm going to max out my HSA account at work, health savings account, same thing happens. Timing we talked about. Also, watch out for this future debt to income. 
this is one thing you want to really think about. So if you're going to borrow all of this money to pay for your kid's school, while the payment's deferred, basically nothing happens to your credit report. So you go to the bank and you want to refinance your mortgage or go get a car, go get a credit card, nothing, it, the loans are on your credit report, but because there's no payments, nothing really happens. But the second they graduate, well, six months after they graduate, the payments start and the payments kick in. I've seen people end up with a really high debt to income, which is what banks look at, and they unintentionally lock themselves out of being able to refinance their mortgage or get a car loan or anything else because their debt to income is way too high for what the banks want. So you do want to think that. You do want to be mindful of that. Right? Do you have a question? No? Okay. And remember, anything like this, so if you get need-based aid, this goes back to understanding the award letter and for younger parents, understanding what your EFC is, if you do any of these strategies, you can impact the need-based aid because your income looks higher, your assets look higher, whatever, and so some of those aid items can go away and that will raise your overall cost of college. Okay, so you wanna be very, so it's not just first year, what do I do, what do I not do? You gotta kinda of think about this while your kid's in school. For those of you with multiple kids, you just have to think about it a long time. <laughs> um, um, because you don't want to do something for your older kid and have an impact your younger kid and so on and so forth. The one thing we'll tell you for those of you with multiple children or who will have multiple children in school at the same time, you do get a little bit of a break. Because when you have multiple children at the same time in school at the same time, your EFC gets divided among those children. So if your EFC is fifty thousand dollars for one kid but then that second kid goes to college, what happens is it's 50,000 divided by two. So each kid gets allocated 25,000, which makes their chances of aid go up. Theory. In reality, what happens is your oldest kid is locked in, but your second kid will benefit. So your oldest kid's aid won't change, but your next, but your next one will get more aid than they normally would have qualified for. And it tends to carry through like that. So if for those of you who think, well, I make too much money, my EFC is gonna to be too high, I'm not gonna get any aid, whatever, that may be true for your first kid, but you wanna start undertaking some strategies to lower your EFC, because once that EFC gets split by two or three, you could very well be in line for need-based aid. And you wanna take on strategies to maintain that or even enhance that. So by the way, this is, I'm gonna go back. This is actually uh, from a USA Today article, I think, or something last year. And, and the point with this article is people use different strategies to pay the college bill. So some of it comes from scholarships, right? The scholarships that your students earn, the outside scholarships. Some of it comes from loans. Some of it comes from like parent income. So that's savings or payment plans. Same thing on the student. I just don't know the relatives and friends, right? Um, if you know, if like if I had, you know, if my, ex, you know, if my wife's mother would like to chip in for our kids' college, I'd be thrilled. Unlikely to happen. If you would like to chip in for my kids' college, I'd be thrilled. Um, you know, um, but but the point of this graph is simply that these options are not mutually exclusive. You can piece together these options, right? So I'll do a little bit of loan, a little bit of payment plan, a little bit out of the five twenty nine whatever, right? And you can kind of piece it together that way, okay? All right, let me go back through this. Okay, so really how to, you know, the big questions really are how to efficiently pay for college, right? How to pay without wrecking your financial future. That's really the key question. Um, which one's right for you? I can't answer that here because everybody's different. And I'm telling you that it's as much philosophical difference as it is a financial difference. So a couple of tips, and even with young, uh, younger students. Number one, set expectations, okay? I can't tell you how many times I ask parents, I'll ask mom, I'll ask dad, or whatever, hey, how much do you want shipping for college, okay? And one parent will say, well, I'll chip, you know, my college is fully paid for, so I want to do everything I can for my child. Great, 
The other parents say, what are you, out of your mind? I had to work, scrape, scrimp through college. If I end up with two cents in my pocket at the end of the month, that's all they're getting. But then I hear this, and this is probably the one that I hear the most. How much do you want to pay for college? Well, you know, it depends. I mean, it depends on how well they do. You know, because, you know, if they're taking engineering, but they get a 2.0, that's okay. But if they get a 4.0 while they're doing advanced shoe tying, that's not okay. You know, so it kind of depends, right? Well, that's not an answer. Right? That's not an answer. Have that conversation with your spouse. Have that conversation with your child. Right? Get on the same page because what I will tell you, and you can find stories on this easily. PBS did a whole series on this about two years ago where mom and dad don't talk about it. And little junior says, well, I got into BU for 70 grand. I really want to go to BU. And they didn't give me aid. Right? So junior accepts BU. Next thing you know, mom and dad got the bill. Mom and dad look at you like, well, I guess we're stuck. I guess junior's going to BU. Right? What do we do now? You know? And we're past the deadline date, so we can't do anything else. So be you it is. Easy find videos on that, how parents' futures get wrecked. Uh, also, the airplane auction mask, figure out which kid you love the most. Um, <laughs> and you know, you want to make sure you help, you want to make sure it's equitable. I get this a lot with uh, families with multiple children. Well, how can we say we give this much to one kid? when we're not gonna have the money for this kid, maybe we have enough to pay for one kid, but we're gonna have to take loans for the second kid, is that really fair? You gotta kind of figure that out, right? And fans do have these discussions, okay? So uh, in terms of handouts, you did have a copy of the presentation. Um, there's a handout from the New Hampshire Higher Education, so the New Hampshire version of MIFA on possible private loan programs, that's front and back, that's kind of the pinkish one. There's a handout on federal student aid for different federal programs. And then also from the New Hampshire version of MIFA, there's actually financial aid, uh, kind of a comparison sheet. So senior parents, you can use that to kind of figure out who got you a good deal or not. Um, or you can at least compare. Um, the only thing I ask, because I apologize for taking up, I think I went over schedule, and I apologize for that. But I hope that this was useful for you. Oh yeah, now that you know this, use it for good. And for those of you junior parents, again, if you hear another parent say, oh yeah, I heard the FAFSA is way too complicated, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna fill it out, what do you say? Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bake them some cookies if you feel guilty. Use this information for good. Don't, get, don't be part of the statistic. Oh, my kid, you know, I took on $200,000 of that for my kid, now I don't know what to do, okay? The only other thing I ask is that there is an eval sheet. Um, I ask you to fill it out, just let me know, good, bad, or indifferent. You can leave it face down going, you know, going out, whatever. If you have questions, I'll be here for a moment tearing down. Uh, but other than that, I thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry I ran a little bit long, but again, I hope I was able to answer the questions that you had and that you got some useful information out of it. All right, and whose head is spinning? Yeah. Head spinning? <laughs> Yeah, it's a complicated game. It's a game that you want to win, but it's very easy to lose. Yes. You do these often, like I mean, now I would like to recommend you know this to some of my friends that are going through or going through. Do you do them frequently? Um, so in the area, so like tomorrow night I'm in Wilmington. Actually, throughout the year, honestly, I do about 40 of these times a year. Companies actually bring me in to actually do these for their employees as well. But I do it Westford, Chelmsford, Acton, Littleton. Warburn, Wilmington, Nashua, Merrimack, Tewksbury, I'm missing somebody. And you'll come back in like a year probably? Yeah, or? so in the fall I'll be back, but to do more like a financial aid 101, which is more around the rules of financial aid, how does financial aid work, it's more meant for sort of people who are really new to the process, like hey, I'm gonna have to fill out the FAFSA soon, like should I go stuff money under my mattress, will that help type thing? <laughs> I'll do that in the fall. This one, I timed this one more for the seniors because seniors are getting their award letters and, the, and parents are going to have to make a decision soon because they have to write a check soon. But I try to tailor it to whoever's in the room. Could I catch your patient for one more question? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else is quite in my situation with these. Um, I'm going to have an agency where I'll put money in a Roth IRA and then go past the five year withdrawal 
Oh. Yep. Yep. After five years, no one built penalties. Yep. Right. Pop it up, and now that shows up as extra income. Yep. So it's still like the grandparent type of IRAs coming all over. Correct. However, so Roth IRAs are a phenomenal college savings vehicle. One of. Believe it or not, I'm actually not a big fan of 529s. I think they're actually way too limiting. But Roth IRAs, when you take out the principal, it counts as untaxed income. So, we, so just like grandparent 529. However, to withdraw the contributions, you don't have to wait five years. You can take the contributions out at any time for any reason, no tax, no penalty. Thus making it a great, so if you have money in a Roth IRA, same thing. Bridge till that time, right? Plus loans till that time, you have 529. When the loans come due, take out the principal, pay the loans off. That's another example. Or you don't have, on the five, the five year test is only on the earnings. Right. Okay. Or I could wait till the last child's last couple of years. Right. Okay. Right. Go ahead and just yep. Write that there. yep. So for those of you younger students, I'll probably be back at some point in the fall. Uh, for those of you with senior students, best of luck to you. Um, yeah, that's all I got. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Yep, that's fine.